Philip is a New Yorker staff writer who's won numerous awards for his two books of non-fiction. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families, which was published in 1998, which analyzes the Rwandan genocide. And A Cold Case, a book that was published in 2001, reinvestigates a 1970 New York double homicide. But he's also written fiction in the form of some short stories. And in fact, he studied fiction at university as a younger man. The RSA events, <laughs> younger than this, he was a child when he went to university. <laughs> He's younger than me, so that's all right. The, the RSA events have an overall title of Nations Unlimited and, and their remit is to look at nations and how they behave and what their future is. And clearly, Philip Gurevich's work on Rwanda and his current writing on Abu Ghraib is very pertinent to this, as indeed is the international outlook of the Paris Review. But Philip, let's speak first about the Paris Review. It's a very interesting publication that had its origins in uh, Paris with a bunch of Americans in, I think, the early 50s. Who were they and what did they want to do? Um, they were a group of uh, young men, as it happened, who were living in Paris in the early 1950s, Americans, um, who were there in the immediate sort of post-war period, uh, not immediate post-war, but the, immediate, the sort of people who had not fought but were there in the early 50s. Uh, they just got out of college. Uh, they were uh, aspiring writers. Uh, they were Americans who uh, were in Paris because it, uh, more than perhaps it does these days to Americans, still retained a great deal of glamour. Um, and it was seen as a city of art and a city of possibility and a city of literature. And it was also a very good place if you had dollars, um, which is, again, a big difference from the present. Um, but, but it was a time when uh, the, you, know, you, could, you could live very cheaply and live a sort of life that was very much influenced, I think, by the memory of the Hemingway, Fitzgerald, uh, Gertrude Stein generation uh, who had preceded them. And uh, they were uh, particularly, the magazine was founded by two men, uh, Peter Mathewson, uh, who has gone on, of course, to be very well known as an American novelist and uh, nonfiction writer a writer on, uh, a nature writer, as well as an explorer, and a writer about American Indians, and a writer about Buddhism, and a writer of novels. Uh, and then uh, a man named Doc Humes, who was a, a, also an American novelist, um, and who had a sort of uh, very brief, stellar career as a, a novelist who got a lot of attention, and then wound up uh, mostly in psychiatric hospitals and then came back out and was sort of a cult figure for a while, but was no longer involved in the Paris Review. But wasn't it funded by the Aga Khan? Uh, it was very early on. What happened was they basically had this idea, let's pu like many people, they thought, let's publish ourselves. Right? Let's put let's, on let's a show. Let's publish our friends. And I think they had this one Terry Southern story um, early on, and, and, and they thought, you know, we should publish this right. Let's start a magazine. And, um, and they hired, uh, they, they realized after they had this idea, well, you know, running a magazine actually requires a certain level of punctuality and order and an editor who's on the job and so forth. And they said, well, let's call our friend George Plimpton, who was a college buddy and a childhood buddy, actually, of Peter Mathewson's, and who was living at that time. He was, he was doing a school year in, in England. And they brought him across the channel on spring break or something and said, you want to edit this? And I guess it it's, it's sort of a testament to the idea of what order and organization and business acumen was at that time that they thought, you know, George, there's a man of discipline <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, and so forth. And they brought him over, and he at some point was down in Pamplona at the running of the bulls with, and, and, he, and with the Aga Khan. And the story is that he looked at the Aga Khan and said, you know, you really ought to run, you ought to, you ought to become the publisher of our magazine. And, uh, and apparently, as they were taking off in a cold sweat, with these bulls coming, they said, oh, uh, he said, okay. And, and that's how the magazine got underwritten at first. And but how George ended up as the editor for the, what was the first 50 years of the magazine. It's a lesson in picking your friends and associates well, though, isn't it? Because uh, the circle went on to be the basis of what was great in 20th century writing and arts and design, too. What were the principles um, uh, of, of who, was be, who was to be admitted into these circles? Well, there was a... Uh, I, I don't know if you've seen the movie Citizen Kane. There's that great moment at the beginning of Citizen Kane where uh, 
or not at the beginning, but at the, mo at the moment when Charlie Kane starts setting up newspapers and he, uh, he writes out his ten principles and publishes them on the front page of the newspaper and of course the implication is these will come back to bite you uh, in the tail and they do. Uh, inevitably Joseph Cotton comes back and he says, you see, um, remember when you wrote this before you became an old wreck? And, and I think that's a normal thing when a magazine starts out. Um, what happened was they turned to the oldest member of their circle at that time and the only one who'd yet published a novel, who was William Styron, who'd written Lay Down in Darkness, uh, William Styron who died this year. And he had just come to Paris and he'd fetched up at Peter Matheson's place. And they s had been talking a lot about, well, what should this magazine be? And it's very important to understand that in that period, uh, what's, what are known as the little magazines, the quarterlies, um, which are magazines that never have much dreams of turning a profit, but do have a dream of having an impact, um, and often do and did, were largely identified with either an aesthetic or a political tendency or trend or school or, or so, so, an ism. Uh, and so you had the formalists and you had the Trotskyites and you had the new left and the new right and the thises and the thats and the so ons and so forth. And they were highly identified with, with criticism with literary criticism specifically and with critical schools, the Partisan Review or the Sewanee Review and so forth. And the very strong uh, impulse behind the Paris Review was they, we, we want to have only one literary rule, one editorial guideline, and that is no lit crit. We want to publish the stuff itself. Poems, fiction by new writers, new voices, not discussions about how Melville matters, and what the new writers mean, but the new writing itself. And that was the impulse behind it, and they asked Bill Styron to write a sort of editorial note for the first edit letter, uh, the first issue, and he wrote it in the form of a letter, and they started editing it and sent it back to him. And he then, what they ended up publishing was a letter from him, angry about their edits of his letter, <laughs> which also captured, I think, very strongly something about the playfulness and openness and uh, adventurousness in a way uh, of, uh, and it's something of a high modernist spirit that's always hung around the Paris Review um, and a little bit of a sense of the absurd. And, it, and basically he had a line in there where he said, you know, we don't want the axe grinders and the table bangers. What we're, we, we're living in a time when literature is not imperiled by Philistinism, but by being buried under learned chatter. Uh, let us look for the good writers, the good poets, the new people with something to say. And that was the manifesto, to the extent that the magazine ever had a manifesto. And if you think about it, it's, it's kind of simple and arrogant at the same time, which is our excellence will be our standard. And the beauty of it was that George Plumpton had very good taste and a very good eye and ear and nose for what was new and might have legs. There were lots of parties, and it was a, it was a focus of, of social life for those people. Well, at the early part, not so much. I mean, yes, of course, it was, a, it was a focus of social life because it was where they lived and worked and ate and put their passions as well as in their own writing. I mean, they then also had a very important contribution to literature that came about a bit inadvertently almost, which was having made this rule against literary criticism, they thought, well, but it is sort of interesting to talk about and write about writing and the writing life and what writers do. And at some point they thought, well, how do we avoid literary criticism and find a way to discuss literature without only publishing short stories by unheard of people? And they had the idea of doing it by interviewing uh, living writers, which if you stop and think about literary history and realize that this was really the first time that people were thinking seriously about embarking on a project of systematic careful interviews of writers, it's kind of amazing.